Mr. Harvey Armstrong. Thank you so much. What a lovely intro. I was born in Chelsea, funny enough. So made in Chelsea. But yeah. But I actually grew up from about six months old in Australia. I was a bit of a troublemaker at school. I haven't had a penny for my parents since I was 18. It's do or die for myself. The whole show is very much a clique, a social scene thing. That first season I really enjoyed because you go in, you're pretty naive and innocent to everything. The deeper things get, the more vulnerabilities you have. It might just be a quick text I mean. Instead, they'll be like, I put a lot of pressure on myself to succeed and I think I was probably a bit of a low point because I was like, I'm a bit lost right now. These you know, real private issues in the relationship, they get exposed to the nation and it's quite tough. I've learned they can get through the public ridicule like that. It's not many harder things. Mm, that's a good point, mate. I don't want to be working for anyone, I want to be doing my own thing. I feel uncomfortable in my comfort zone. Make decisions quick and learn fast. Don't sort of sit idle. Guys, it's Matt Haycox here, and welcome to another episode of The Matt Haycox Show, where today I've got a guest who is a breakout star from a UK reality show. He's got legions of fans around the world. He's grown his own beer brand into a 10-figure business. He is the star of a Made in Chelsea. He's the CEO of Primetime Lager, Mr. Harvey Armstrong. Thank you so much. What a lovely intro. Oh, uh, you've got a lot to live up to now. I'm not sure about the fans all over the globe. <laughs> well, yeah, I've got some in the Northern Hemisphere, some in the Southern. Probably not every country, though. <laughs> where, where are you from originally? Uh, I actually grew up in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia. Oh, so really? my, yeah, so half Australian. My dad's an Aussie. Um, I was born in Chelsea, funnily enough. So made in Chelsea is where it all began. Uh, but I actually grew up from about six months old in Australia. For how long? Till I was 12. Okay. And then I moved across to Spain, um, where my mum grew up in Gibraltar. Um, so then I lived in the south of Spain. So yeah, I never, I've never actually lived in the UK like by family. Um, and kind of then... Went to boarding school in the UK um, from 13. So Which one? sort of got shipped away. Parents didn't love me and all that. Um, which boarding school? Uh, Claysmore to start, okay. which was like a sort of in, the, in Dorset, southwest UK. I went to and a then, prep boarding school from 11 to 13. Yeah. I was supposed to go to rugby. You know, rugby? Rugby, yeah. yeah. We, we looked at that school, yeah. Uh, I was, I was, um, I, I did like normal school, well, I said normal school, non boarding to 11. Went to boarding from 11 to 13, supposed to prime me for rugby, but then I got, I got, well, I got kicked out of the first one at 11 to go to this one, then got kicked out of that one at 13, and then uh, my parents decided they better keep me at home. Uh, was it one of those, the, the problem child? I, don't, I never thought it was a problem child. I, mean, I never did anything particularly bad, or not, not that I would constitute bad, but uh, it was just like a, a proliferation of little things that built up. Yeah, and no, I, I was a bit of a troublemaker at school as well, but sort of just, borderline kept myself there <laughs> just uh yeah a bit of a class clown but yeah and then I, then I went to Sherbin which was kind of uh competitive to rugby um and then up to Newcastle University so I've kind of spent my I guess young childhood and personal childhood in the UK but never kind of lived here as a as a fact from a family perspective so tell me about the childhood in terms of you know what were your dreams and aspirations back then you know how privileged and upbringing was it because I guess you know people who know you from the from the show always default to the fact that you know everyone on Made in Made in Chelsea is a, a trust fund baby. Yeah, there's definitely that pre notion. I have I've had a really privileged upbringing, not by any means what people would uh, think from you know the stereotype that we that we have from the show at all. Just just modest and you know. N nice family just having the, I don't know it's, it's hard it's, it's all relative isn't it but we were never I, don't, I've, I haven't had a penny from my parents since I was 18 it's not I, I don't get fed anything it's just they brought me up well and they've let me in, out into the world um, and there isn't sort of any fallback money there isn't inheritance I don't I don't have sort of lovely properties around the world and I can go like drop everything be like it's all sorted my parents have done it all it's none of that it's like it's, it's do or die for myself um, so I definitely don't come from trust funds or what a lot of money. What did they do for living, your parents? They, my dad was in insurance throughout his life, insurance career. Um, he was actually a trained lawyer at university, but then went into insurance. Um, an incredibly clever guy, but kind of um, at an early age, well, at an early adult age, became sort of deaf, which affected his... Um, oh, really? Yeah. Um, Full, which effect, Fully deaf? No, just like slowly um, deteriorated. Uh, to a point where he's probably like 89% deaf now. But it, then it had a big knock-on effect to his sort of career path and not being able to sit in board meetings and listen, like, and so many things. So that kind of, I think, probably stunted his progression slightly. But, you know, you know great sort of accomplished um, professionals. And my mum now sort of runs a branch of Savills out in Gibraltar. 
Um, so she's kind of been in interior design, and then into real estate, and then now sort of yeah, director of Savills in Gibraltar. So she's yeah, she's an inspiration. She hustles hard. So I guess both you know both pretty entrepreneurial themselves. Mm. Is is that where you got your uh, your, your early early desire to be in business? <sighs> Do you know I I've not, yeah, I'm still on that searching mission of of where I get my drive and why. Um, but I, I, when I was young, back in Australia, mum you know, used to be like you used to like run around looking for money on the floor you used to like put your finger into phone booths and you know like when back in the day we used to use like pay phones and see if there's any you're not like... that old are you <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no i can say I, I i've seen them in use yeah i used to put my finger in them and try and find like if there was any spare like coins in the bottom i used to kind of like we had this thing in australia called um trash and what do we call it trash and treasure yeah trash and treasure where um, but it was basically the council tip uh, every six months everybody would throw all their stuff out and for free you know the council would come up and pick it all up you know old tvs old sofas um but to us as kids we were like we would r- rummage through it all being like you know this is this is treasure and, we, and we'd sort of then recirculate through the, these houses trying to sell it back to people and like little sort of things like that and doing sort of silly tuck shop type things at school so i always had that um want and drive don't know where it but i don't know where it stemmed from Okay, well, I guess prior to business, you you finished boarding school and you went to Newcastle University. Yeah. Is that right? Mm-hmm. To study finance and accounts? Exactly that, business, accounting and finance, yeah. And uh, what, I mean, what, why, did you, why did you pick that career? Or sorry, why did you pick that degree? What was, what was the plan at that point? So I was only 17, sort of applying the same way you do for UCAS, any other course. But this course meant that I, it was a fast track. It was like a scholarship course from to get your ACA. And for me... At that time, sort of not knowing what I really wanted to do in my sort of degree, which not many people do, and settling for like a geography or business thing just to keep things general. I was like, I just want to, you know, I want to do something that's a bit more challenging, a bit more forward sort of, um, a bit more of a forward step and, and actually make some money while I'm at university. So this, you know, I didn't really know what accounting was at the time. I was just like, right, I know that I can fast track to what's a very kind of well-regarded uh, qualification and sort of make money while I'm at university and not kind of go to uni and enjoy that kind of I guess stage of life um but not sort of leave after three or four years and be like what have I just you know what have I actually achieved like just got pissed up so I wanted to kind of have a balance of the two and it was a perfect course for that and yeah and it sort of fast tracked me it meant after uh, I qualified after one year of leaving uni so kind of got that ACA out of the way because it was dull um, and it did, you know, it, it provided an amazing base and it gave me a like, great understanding of business and challenged me at a young age and, you know, developed a lot of professional skills at a young age. But then I was just like, this is not, this does not sort of invigorate me. This doesn't get me out of bed in the morning. This doesn't make wake me up on a Monday. I want something like more kind of thought provoking. And, and after uni, it, did you get a job with PwC, was it? Yeah. That was straight away. It was it was some kind of not not apprenticeship program, but you know what I mean. They, they, they were tied to the uni. With yeah. So the idea was that we worked basically one term while we we're at university down in London or all over the, over the UK. But I personally was down in London because I sort of chose that to be my sort of base. And the other two terms were up in Newcastle, so just living normal uni life. Um, I our terms were extended. We did, we got less hot summer holidays and all that. And our, it was quite it was a more intense course than usual, but. Ultimately, yeah, we were very much living uni life for two months, uh, two terms, and then sort of working hardcore for one term. Uh, and it was basically because in accounting, in audit, um, there's a busy season when the sort of majority of companies' financial year ends yeah. end, and they basically use us, these little minions, to like increase the workforce and we go down and help out in busy season. You were working in audit, were you mainly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get absolutely um, whipped and, yeah. And then go back and enjoy enjoy uni again. And yeah, so I basically did a year's worth of my work experience uh, throughout my university career and 12 exams out of the 15 total exams and 450 days work experience. Were you getting paid for that work at the mm, time? Yeah. And, and did, did you do any other work to kind of pay your way through uni? That was enough. Um, and I did I did some promotional bits, which was the classic, but I sort of didn't massively enjoy that. And I, I think it was mainly because I like had uh, so much going on. Um, for a uni student that, you know, it wasn't sort of a necessity. 
how did, how did you actually get the PWC gig in the first place? I mean, I guess you know, contextually, we're we're recording this in in, in August time, aren't we? So I think uh, my uh, well, my daughter's about to get a GCSE results next uh, next week, and A level people are soon after. So you know, for, for for people for people looking you know looking for a career, looking for internships or scholarships with big names like that, how did you actually go about it? So I did a bit of research. I'd heard about these courses. I think I'd heard, seen or heard of it at like a like one of those. Um, what do they call career them? Fairs. Career fairs, yeah, yeah, back in the day. And I was just like, I love it. Because the, they do them with Deloitte, so they do them with KPMG, um, uh, Ernest & Young, all the big four. So, if, yeah, if you are looking, have a look around for, you know, the big four accounting firms. Um, and they do them across different universities, not just Newcastle. I think PwC do one down in Reading as well. And then I think Deloitte do Durham and somewhere else. So there's a bit of variation. And each, each course is also kind of varied in terms of how intense it is. Some are like full time working throughout the year and a bit of uni, some are more uni and a bit of working. But yeah, ultimately I applied for it in the same way I would UCAS. I'm trying to remember back now. And but in but it was a much more intense kind of UCAS process. I had to go up to Newcastle, have a few interviews, do like a, a training day or like a personal kind of testing day. I forget what they're called. And do all of that and then yeah, and then got in. Yeah. Definitely worth looking at if yeah, for your for children as well. So how long did you, you finish uni? You went to then work at PwC full time. How long did that career last? Uh, until I was qualified, um, and then I yeah, then but I you sort quit of quit straight away. Pretty much, pretty much. Like I did, yeah, I wanted to get qualified. It was it was a sort of challenge I set myself from the beginning. I'd invested sort of four years into it, you know, through the uni process. Um, I guess along the way, I was like, as great as I know this is as a base and sort of as a financial understanding process for me, I was like, oh, this isn't my career path. And I know that, like, I kind of looked up to the partners and go, I don't want to be like you, so why am I going to kind of keep climbing this ladder, pushing myself through some journey which I know I'm better suited elsewhere. So, yeah, so I kind of I got qualified, ticked that box, and I went, right now, like, let's 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 have a breather and be like, all right, what do I want? I know I want, I want higher risk, I want higher reward, I want kind of bigger challenges, I want something that invigorates me, I want something that... Just pushes me well out of my comfort zone and I was kind of comfortable there and so I just I went away for a little bit and you were um, you 23, 23 I was 23 I would have been just 23 yeah so then I yeah but then then you go into that sort of headspace of now what is it like I need to figure this one out because yeah so I, I started interviewing for like corporate finance jobs and, but had you quit at that point you quit with nowhere to go or you, or you just no I started quit? interviewing for sort of more commercially facing like financial jobs like corporate finance or private equity um investment banking but the common feedback was you great cv great this great that you don't don't feel like you really want to be here i was like yeah i can't really convince you that i have a passion for you know for for finance like for numbers for playing with excel spreadsheets sorry i don't <laughs> but i do have a passion for business and i do have a passion for sort of growing things and and um yeah i thought i kind of slowly through i guess getting a few knockbacks from those interviews was like actually you know what i think i don't I, I don't want to be working for anyone i want to be doing my own thing and that's where my sort of passion lies so what came first made in chelsea or the beer brand the beer brand and and is that so is yeah. that next in this story yeah yeah so then we quit pwc we 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 i'm just i don't know why i'm speaking about myself <laughs> Very odd. Yeah, so then I quit I quit PwC and then I took a few months out. I went back to my roots in Australia just to kind of have a breather and like figure out exactly where I wanted to go. I think I, I put a lot of pressure on myself to succeed. And I, kind of, I think that was probably a bit of a low point because I was like, I, I'm a bit lost right now. And I really want to be like thriving and succeeding. And it's when your sort of peers are all in their beginning of their sort of careers and you're like, oh, fuck. He's on, he's on that, he's on that. And you get that kind of like competitive nature going. But yeah, I sort of went away and I was like, what do I love? I love beer. I sort of saw a bit of a gap in the market for, um, well, it started with the caffeine infused lager. Um, and that was really sort of seeing a gap in the market at the back end of my travels um, for, well, I was out in Ibiza and we were sort of second night on the trot and seeing kind of, kind of the popularity of espresso martinis, vodka red bulls. Um, but I'm just a like, beer drinker. I drink beer start to finish. And I was trying to sort of, I guess, solve the conflicting love triangle of having a beer, having a good time and being into your sports and fitness. And yeah, that was basically where the caffeine infused was born on the second night out, tired, didn't really want to go out. Boys were like, come on, mate, have a beer. 
you know, have a coffee, get get back get back on it. And I felt way better, but it just didn't settle the co- the sort of warm like creamy coffee and the cold fizzy beer. So why has caffeine not been put into that into into lager? Um, you know, being the most consumed form of alcohol in the world, lager and caffeine, seeing a clear consuming need on nights out for caffeine and alcohol through other you know alternatives, and then also. I guess, yeah. So that's where sort of the seed of prime time began. And did you set it? Did you set up with a, a business partner or a friend, or did you set up on your own? Yes, yeah, so I did it originally with my mum's. Um, I mean, in the very early stages, with um, my mum's boyfriend, who's actually worked in the sort of alcohol space okay. um, in Spain, south of Spain, for twenty, thirty years. So he kind of had the early um, experience um, to even know where where we start. And then I brought on um, my current co-founder, uh, Sam, at the very early stages. And that then leads us on to going on to the show. And yeah, so so Tom... So, 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 just, so just before we go on to the show, how uh, so how established is the business at this point? I mean, obviously, your you, your uh, mom's boyfriend, he's got the experience of the, of the alcohol industry. But you know, just tell me a bit about the setup process. You know, were you just scrambling around finding your feet were you trying to learn at the same time obviously you've got the the financial background of the accountancy but you still didn't know business business you know what 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 were you I guess what was a typical day looking like so it we were really at the sort of research stage and just really like assessing one is there any is are we the first people to do this two is there any competition out there how can we actually get this done is it is it feasible uh, sort of thinking of names, thinking of kind of ways we actually make this kind of thought and concept a reality. It was really early stages. So we started sort of just, you know, outreach to breweries, um, doing a few tra- trial and errors, even just testing a few things at home, you know. Breweries crushing. like contract breweries who could who could brew for you. Yeah, yeah. So we were kind of at that really early stage. We didn't have a name. We hadn't tried anything. We were just, yeah, literally putting together budgets to, to see how much this could cost, getting quotes, you know, to build out our budgets. Um, and just, I guess, yeah, feasibility testing. Yeah, in that process, at the early stages, yeah, I was asked to go on the show. I'd been asked to go on years back. How'd they find you? I was at university with, uh, living with a good mate who was good mates with a girl on the show at the time. Um, and that's kind of how they find you that, you know, it's kind of a social scene or a, you know, once removed. It's like, if you know them who's on it, then we can get you on if you kind of fit the bill and all of that. Are people, because I know it's like scripted reality, but are people genuinely mates or mates of mates? Or do they ever just go and find a couple of people to, to drop into the show as, you know, complete random as to, um, you know, put the uh, cat among the pigeons? Yeah, I mean, there, there are genuine relationships on the show. Like, I've got some really good mates on there, and, and there's no sort of fake around that. But I think to sometimes to seed people in, they do just say, oh, yeah, these guys went to university together, but they didn't. Right. Or, yeah. And then, you know, because the whole, the whole show is very much a, a clique, a, a, like a sort of friendship circle, like social scene thing. So, like, you kind of have to have an in in some way or shape or form and then it develops from there quite naturally so you got asked to do the show and i mean were, were you thinking that this could be a good avenue for the uh for promoting the beer or did you just fancy fancy a bit of fun on the telly no it was exactly sort of the latter in that um yeah so i got asked when i was leaving uh university and, and starting my sort of financial career and at that point i explored it because i'm sort of i want to assess the opportunity i wanted to understand get sort of behind the screen a little bit and understand what they get paid how the job like role works could i actually balance it with my financial career i, I even kind of looked at it at that point just to sort of see if i get another re- revenue stream but like it just didn't suit what i was doing at the time it didn't sort of um so then when i left pwc sort of started prime time and then sort of was I was I was getting asked throughout because there's a lot there's a lot when I mean, we could be here for hours if we get into it but there's, there's there's a lot of that of like connections I had through the show because my ex who kind of broke up with me and went on to the show so she was always on it and because of that and a bit of back and forth between us like um throughout sort of that year after the breakup they were always like who's that guy who's that guy get him on get him on but it just didn't see me at the time. But then, yeah, it got to the point where prime time started and they were still asking. And I was like, you know what, this now makes sense. I can use it as a sort of marketing tool, you know, um, build brand awareness. Um, and also I was very much at the early stages of, I didn't have another income stream. I needed to make money somehow to one, keep my head above water, two, find some money to take get this business off the ground. So it was kind of a like pairing of the two. 
Um, oh, and what are like the rough economics or, or, or the kind of you know, business behind you know, a show like Made in Chelsea, you know, in terms of you know, how, how do you get paid? How much of its time, how much of your time does it take? And, and obviously from your own perspective, you know, you wanted to promote the brand. How overt can you be about that? Yeah, so I guess the structure is you, you get paid in a day rate form. So, you, you know, if we film 12 hours, it's the same as if we film two. And that can happen, you know, there's long days filming. Sometimes you're in and out quite quick. So... Um, and it starts very much like any job, um, quite low, and then you kind of progress as you earn your stripes and, and so. You're there and for so longer. different people on the show get paid different amounts, are they? Because I mean, I, I know nothing about, it, but you, you, I used to you know, read in the papers, you know, not that you know what's true or not, but like on on Tawi, for example, you know, like everyone gets what are like hundred quid an episode or some you know some pittance, but you know everyone's on the same same uh, baseline. But then you know you're using it as a stepping stone to um, to to get whether it's PAs or launch your own brand or whatever it may be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, yeah, so people are on different rates. Those that have been there longer are on, on sort of higher rates, which is sort of only fair. It's the same way, you know, at a company um, as you climb the ladder. And then, yeah, you obviously have your exterior revenue from you know, Instagram and yeah, PAs, which are less of a thing now. Show my age, aren't I? <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I don't know. I think the market's become saturated. There are so many influencers out there from all these like uh, Love Island seasons and all these other reality tv shows that have come out of nowhere that uh, that whole pa scene is just has become a bit flat you're not that excited by this reality tv star that comes down and <clears throat> you know says hello to you in a club it's just that whole thrill has been lost i think do, do you find that same i guess that same knock-on effect you know to the likes of paid instagram posts and stuff as well because i mean again you know go back a few years you know having a million followers on instagram was like a big deal you know, mm. whereas, you know now there's there's so many people whether they've come from a tv show or whether they're just a you know a hot girl with bikini pics or whatever you know i mean being hot and having a big number of followers I mean, doesn't 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 really mean much. I mean, as as that has a knock on effect with your with people's earning capacity. Um, I think so. I say I think so because obviously I don't have a comparison personally because I've only been in sort of the last three four years making money through Instagram. But what I what's clear is that people on this show ten years ago on my show their followers just flew up. You know, up you know half a million a million if they were on the show for four years. Mine have gone to a hundred thousand after four years. So and because of that, you're then you know, not you're not going to be earning as much as they once were, and I, I mean, to be fair, I know back in the day they they were earning a lot of money, like the the beginning sort of early main Chelsea stars, because main Chelsea was one of the first, if not the first, like reality TV show in the UK that really took off. So, like my business partner Gareth, part prime time, his husband Ollie was one of the first. Well, I think he was. He actually opened. He did the first scene of main Chelsea, and he's only just sort of left it. So he's done a good 10, 11 year stint on it. And he was saying back in the day, they actually like people would come up screaming to them, like they were proper celebrities. And now it's like, yeah, oh, loser. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so you you talk about him as your business partner. Were you were you friends before uh, the show, or did you meet on the show for him to become your business partner? Yeah, I met him on the show, and oh. we just clicked. And yeah, he's very sort of business savvy and a lovely guy. Uh, and yeah, sort of got on really well with Ollie as well. And I was, again, in the early stages of prime time um, and looking for that kind of, I guess, mentor type, uh, someone with a bit more experience in business to kind of lead us in the right direction. Um, so that's kind of where he came on board in like an advisory role to start, yeah. Had you had any mentors prior to that? No. Anyone, anyone that you consider a mentor? No, no, so I was going in it in quite quite blind <laughs> and um so i mean talk talk about the show you know f first day you know excited nervous you know terrified terrified yeah so i guess back to that so quickly i i really wanted a like a business partner in this journey and that was one of the, my biggest anxieties doing like a good few months of it on my own i was like this is you know this is gonna be a scary journey and then had the opportunity to go on the show and i then asked sam who's sort of my best mate at the time um and now business partner and best mate to come and join me because they had said you can come out to buenos aires it was like an away series and i was like well i'm not doing that on my own that's terrifying going on tv like then they kind of incentivized me to double my salary and then they were like um double your salary before you'd even started wow double my day rate it really, it's it really wasn't much of a difference but it was just a, a nice little goodwill gesture and then they're like you can bring a friend with you i was like okay okay now we're talking now we're talking so sam was over in australia um on like doing a bit of traveling on his own and i was like mate i think like you know his dad had been helping us with the branding his dad's in uh, um like 
had years of experience in branding, um, had a big branding agency. And at the very early stages of prime time, he was yeah shaping up the yeah what was early prime time. We didn't even have a name at the time. Um, and I was like, mate, your dad's helping the branding. You're kind of free. He was in promotion scene uh, in, in London, knows like loads of people in hospitality. Um, an amazing guy, like the friendliest guy going. And was also kind of on that, um, I guess, business like soul finding mission. Uh, and I was like, man, why don't we go out to Buenos Aires? Come with me. We'll do the show. He'd all, he's, he'd also been asked in the past, so he kind of knew what it was about and knew f- people on it. And we'll start to promote prime time, and we'll say we're out there. And day our first scene was like, what are you doing out here? We bump into everybody, and they try and make it like really casual, like, whoa, how do you come here? And we we're like, oh, we're just um, we've got some meetings, some breweries out here, and we just started spilling this like kind of fake story, or well, not fake, but just like very much advanced to where we were, knowing that we're gonna eventually launch his product um and slowly yeah getting the feelers out there that it's harvey and sam who do this beer brand and that's kind of where it started yeah and so i mean you, you're a few years into the show now is it four years coming up to four years four yeah years. i mean any any particular highlights any low lights you know i mean do you enjoy it as much as you you did in the beginning <sighs> i'll tell you what that, that first season i really enjoyed because you go in you're you're pretty um naive and sort of innocent to everything and then it gets deeper and deeper, really, because you actually do develop real sort of connections with the people, real emotions with girls. And then the deeper things get in that way, the more kind of vulnerabilities you have because you can get exposed in certain ways. So it definitely loses its kind of like young, fun, free feels. And it goes into a bit more like, right, this is, this is quite intrusive on life. But I always justify it with what I'm trying to do in the bigger picture and, and what I'm trying to do with prime time. And, and also I always look back to my PwC days and use it as comparison to like, I'd rather be doing this and sitting at a laptop, like, you know, working nine to five for the, for the man. So. And how, how did they come up with the stories? I mean, as in how much is, let's say your genuine day-to-day life that becomes a story and, and how much is them saying, right, you know, you and Matt and Claire, we need to get you guys together and start having an argument about something. It's very much the core of, of everything that happens is very much real. It's sort of where that's, we seed the shows kind of, we give them the idea and they kind of run with it because the idea comes from, oh, I quite like that girl or my mate pissed me off the other night, I need to have a word with him. And then they will kind of go, right, we'll put you together, have a word with him. Whereas you might not normally kind of bother having that confrontation or it might just be a quick text, like, mate, we all good. Said they'll be like, it's a great way to get dates, isn't it? You'd be like, I like that girl, I like that girl. Like, well, we'll, we'll set you up can on you doing that you, one. Can you pay for the tabs? <laughs> <up?"> <laughs> she's, like, she's, she's like, no, you're like, no, you've got to do it. It's work. You're on yeah, a day yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a bit like that. It's uh, the one perk. You had, uh, you had a big fallout with uh, Miles Nazaire, I think. On the recent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he's a troublemaker. He likes to stick his nose in. But, you what know. What happened? Are you friends again? Or? No, we're not friends at the moment. I don't think we've been massively friends for a while um sort of he's an all right guy he's just not my cup of tea yeah we just had a little clash between girls i guess you know sort of kissed the girl that i was sort of dating at the time but kind of all in good faith there and i think you, you found yourself in the spotlight when you were caught cheating with your girlfriend as well that was it yeah that was a big one that was probably the biggest regret well definitely <laughs> <laughs> not probably um <laughs> Yeah, so that and th- in times like that, you know, you have these you know real private issues in your relationship, and they get exposed to the nation, and it's quite tough. And in terms of getting exposed, I mean, like, how does that come about? Is that something she'd found out about privately, and then it became something on the show, or did you get confronted about it on air? It was, yeah. I mean, it starts with the fact that we were just on a night out, and someone sent her a photo, which happens so often. Like you can just be on a night out doing, uh, being innocent, like being in a club, maybe being near a girl and like people will actually go out of their way to send that, you know, your other half, but maybe boy or girl, whatever way, but it's around just in the celebrity world, a photo being like, oh, they're up to no good. It's like, yeah. Um, and that had happened a few times in the past, but never anything come from it, as in it, never, it was never. But then like one night it did actually, I actually fucked up and by chance this photo got sent around and that's kind of where it started and then i was like look i need to speak to you but so yeah but then the show it got messy but yeah that it wasn't a nice one 
And I mean, look, the fans of shows seem to get very bought in, and and, and you know, I guess I mean, even with soap operas, they they tend to believe that the character that that particular actor is playing is like a real person, and 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 they get invested positively and negatively. Uh, I mean, you know, for for someone on the very public side of a of a breakup, and where you were you were. I would assume the one that people were hating on as the one who done the cheat did the cheating. I mean, did that did that affect your your business life? Did it affect the brand negatively? Of oh, course, good question. It affected me personally for a bit because it was just you know those you know, lo- losing your girlfriend and, and and that sort of tough mental time could probably slow me down a bit with business because I had my head elsewhere. Um, but business was always my escape. I was like, right, fucked up there, like back to business. Let's like like hone down now and, and focus on the bigger picture. But I don't think it had a material negative impact, but I'm sure thinking of, about it, it probably, you know, it's not a positive outlook in the short term. But I think, you know, people all make mistakes and people are in a way sort of forgive and forget and there's the next big sort of blow up on the on the show or, you know, people move on. So it's sort of... And, and, you, and you mentioned your mental health from that. I mean, let's just talk mental health in general, you know, with, with, with reality TV, with, with celebrity. I mean, how, how have you found it's affected you, if at all? And what, what, what kind of support do you get from the show? Um, I like to think I've got a thick skin. So I've kind of probably been able to sort of take on the chin quite a few rocky patches on the show, um, which there are. It can get it can get very intense. It's like I mean, out, out in Bali, for example, we're filming out in Bali. It's like quite a, like tight knit group. There's like 13, 14 of us, and I'm out there with my ex, and then her boyfriend comes, and like things like that, you just would never be in that position in real life, but it happens, um, and it can get very sort of heavy. But they, yeah, the, the show always there to offer you sort of like support, therapist support, and all that. If you know they see that you need it, um, it's always there on, on standby if you ever need it. How long are you contracted for? Is it like season to season? Yeah, I think it's year to year actually, and there's seasons within that. And how long can you see yourself doing it for? I think in my head, there's a scale, there's a sort of prime time main Chelsea scale, and it's until sort of prime time gets itself to a point where the value of me sort of building the my personal profile and you know the brand awareness I drive through the show starts to really not start moving the needle of the business, mm. and I th- maybe a year, and I how- think. How do you balance your time with that at the moment? How much? So, how many hours a week is filming commitments? It varies depending on sort of how much you're involved in storyline and you're filming. At max, probably a 20, 30 hour week, thirty okay. hour week, I'd say. At minimum, well, at minimum, nothing, nothing. You can do nothing. <laughs> and how, how much time are you spending on the business? The rest of my waking Full hours, time. pretty much. Yeah. And I mean, do, do you find it hard to struggle? Sorry, do you find it difficult to balance your commitments? It, yeah, I am more so now um just because i am filming a lot and business is kind of yeah full throttle and we're growing and there's a lot to manage but i've got an amazing partner that like allows me to kind of go off and do these like that other side and sort of the whole business model we've always you know gone down is this is part of prime time you know building that profile being out there like i had to go off to corsica and film for well five weeks i went back for prime time for about a week and a half in the middle but um you know, it's hard because everybody's out there. They're having a good time. They're in their summer mode filming. That's their day done. Then I'm sort of bringing my laptop up every evening and trying to do work well or, or during the day and they're sort of sun lounging and drinking and you're like, oh, the distractions. But like, you, yeah, it's, it takes a bit of discipline. Um, I've just noticed a primetime T-shirt, actually. Yeah, that's a bit of our merch. <laughs> got the uh, tattoo here as well. Oh, really? I got that for camera because like, like, you can't wear anything. Oh, that actually, I, I avoid, let's I, hope I, it's not too premature, eh? Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> well, I can always get the red X and we'll start I've, going. I've, yeah. I've got an ex-business partner tatt- tattooed on my arm and I fucking hate it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can put the X or put, put a balaclava over him or something. Yeah, so I, I mean, I put this here because... Uh, I think one of your questions was like, how much can you promote um, on the show? And there are limitations. Ofcom, I think it is the regular regulatory board, basically kind of, which is funny. We were having this chat the other day, but you can only, if I was to do a brand launch, I can mention the brand name once and I can show the brand label once. But funnily enough, if it's not your brand, I like my friend has a sunglass brand. So he's not allowed to wear his sunglasses on, but they go, but take are. those off, but put on um, Ray-Bans. And it's like, why, but why can't you promote Ray-Bans and not, but you can't do self-promotion. There's okay. a limitation on it, which is, you know, but... But, but, it, but can, other, can other people on the show talk, talk about your brand? No. Right. I think it's to do with the the kind of cast, yeah, members and any kind of, I guess, personal interest. But yeah, so that's why I I got this tattooed 
here because you can't wear anything branded. So I just sort of get put it there and I like talk <laughs> in the scene yeah. and I make sure people are like everyone's yeah, like, why, why is Harvey always thinking? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, hmm, it's a good point you make there. So yeah. Well, look, let's 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 dig deeper into the into the brand and into the business. I mean, I, I don't know how much you you you, you can or, uh, or or will share, but you know, in terms of uh, growth and numbers, and I mean, I, 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 you know, how does it work? Where's it where's it sold to? Where's it supplied? Are we in bars? Are we in shops? Is it still contract brewed? Yeah, so we are mainly sort of London based. On trades, our focus so bars, pubs, restaurants. Um, when well, you say it's your focus, is it your sole? So do you do any off trade? Um, is it canned or anything as well? Yeah, well, it's canned, and we do sort of a lot of festivals and, mm-hmm. and events, which sort of ca- works for cans. Um, yeah, we're in Eat Seventeen, which is like kind of a small off trade, like kind of a whole foodsy type um, thing. Uh, and we're sort of now really knocking the doors of the supermarkets because we're at the, kind of that point now. We're eighteen months in. We are you know, really proving ourselves on the on trade, and that's where you can sort of break the first door down. You can't just walk yourself into Tesco or Sainsbury's, yeah. but you can into the pub next door. So, you know, you show, you prove yourself on the on-trade, um, build up, you know, footprint, show there's clear demand there, prove concepts, um, and that that we've done. We've got, we're in over 120 accounts now. We're selling really well. Um, are you doing that through a wholesaler or are you doing, don't, doing it direct? So uh, some direct, some through wholesalers. We've got a number of wholesalers now, um, sort of across London and the UK. Yeah, and, and direct. It's, it's, it's a bit of a web, a logistical web. And, and London's the bigger market because that's where you're focused or because, because you get the benefit of being on the show down here? It's where I'm based. It's where my partners kind of and my, my own connections lie in terms of, you know, that low hanging fruit and, you know, bars and pub owners that we know. Um, and yeah, it's just where I, it's where I want to sort of build my business and, and my career. And, 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 and how, I mean, obviously the, the, the caffeine is, is unique, but I mean, I mean, craft brewing as an industry, I mean, it, I mean, it's very, very saturated. I mean, yeah, every man and a dog set, you know, set, set up, set up, a, um, you know, some kind of craft brewery. I mean, obviously you, you've got, uh, you've got your name to, uh, to sell off you, you're on the telly and, and you've got the caffeine, but I mean, how, how are you struggling or not struggling? How are you faring against competition and, and how much would, or would you agree or disagree with what I've just said? So, are you, so sorry, just to kind of fully understand your your question. There. So I guess, so, I guess in, uh, short answer is I'm saying uh, craft brewing is a very very saturated mm, market. Yeah, um, you know everybody fancies starting a craft beer, uh, and the, you know they they open and close on a on, on a probably daily uh, daily basis. Uh, you've got some unique qualities in there, you know, with the, with the caffeine uh, and, and with with your own personal brand. But um, I mean, how how have you fared trying to trying to get in against the competition? Yeah, so you're completely right. Craft beer market is saturated, um, and there was a huge growth of it ten sort of eleven years ago. Um, you know, with the likes of Camden Hills, Beaver Town, Mean Time, um, Brew Dog who are all, you know, still flying. But then you had all these sort of trailers coming off the back of them and not doing any differential sort of points in that they just, this different tasting, you know, crafted beer with more TLC than the one on the left and the right. And there's sort of more funky branding. We've kind of gone down the functional better for you route. We're trying to tap into the health conscious consumers who are still looking to enjoy themselves and have a beer. Because you're low calorie as well. Yeah, so we've got two SKUs. We've got the caffeine infused and we have the normal lager they're both low calorie low carb gluten-free vegan and also award-winning on taste so kind of the first tick box we went out to achieve was a great tasting beer no consumer wants to um or will sort of pay for a beer which they actually don't enjoy drinking so that was like right this has to be great tasting and then everything we can remove from that afterwards is a bonus so just removing the unnecessaries is what we call it carbs calories you know doesn't have to be gluten and that's what we've gone and done and that's how we sort of differentiate we're not just your next craft beer we're are actually looking to create the next wave in beer and that being your more functional better for you beer and, and is, is, is anyone else out there yet doing you know infusing now with caffeine or, or stri- stripping out some of those ingredients no one is has done a caffeine infused low calorie lager i have seen cbd lager i've seen protein lager uh so people are putting kind of functional benefits into lager and sort of seeing that there is um a consumer kind of interest there people are, are doing the low calorie side again it's quite a sort of infant part of the industry um i guess you've seen it with uh cause light and bud light who kind of their premise is that it's lower calorie but it's only because of the fact that it's lower in abv than their other product and therefore by default it lowers the calories it's not kind of 
designed to be a kind of better for you lower calorie beer and nor does the taste kind of um support you know people drinking it it's kind of given actually the the light beer space a bad name because they taste awful (laughs) so i mean business and money in general i mean obviously you know you've always you've always wanted to to be successful uh you know you've wanted to find find your way in business i mean how, how important to you is money uh, you know, I mean, what and, and what is your definition of success? Well, I think money is just a metric to measure success. It's not actually the driver. It's a challenge for me. I, I like to, I, I feel, it's hard to explain. I feel uncomfortable in my comfort zone. If I'm not sort of doing something every day that like pushes me out or challenges me or makes me think, well, oh, that got my heart rate going or that kind of got my adrenaline pumping. I feel like I haven't really achieved that day. And I think sort of I guess diving headfirst into business and doing it you know something I've never done and you know was the first step in why I, why I did it because I was like this is scary like and I had so many days where I was just actually resistant to doing anything because I was like I don't really know what to do or where to go or what's like how to start and then each day you know, I've now just like how it feels so natural that I'm on this path and I think that was part of breaking out that comfort zone each day each day till I've now kind of become a comfort zone so now I'm kind of looking for like how do I I don't know, take more risks in the business or, you know, drive it forward more. I guess do other things like, you know, even podcasts like this or going onto TV to build the profile, all these sort of things. Yeah. And, um, I mean, from a personal challenge perspective, you want to push yourself out of your comfort zone and, and I guess, earn more money from that respect, from that perspective, from, from your actual current financial circumstances i mean have you have you got enough have you got enough money if it wasn't if it wasn't just a challenge of earning more you know are, are you are you are you happy happy with what you're earning or is it is it is it as much a a success metric as it is something you need for yourself oh, i th- i'm definitely at the stage of still needing it to to at least like you know but like one of my main drivers is i want to bring a family into an amazing life that you know is completely financially stable and supportive and it means that when i do have children and a wife and kids, I can I can really sort of switch semi off business and really like focus on them. And I'm definitely not at that stage, <laughs> so I'm still very much in the you know basic founders wage. Still, you know, I've got a few other revenue streams which I use to kind of you know enjoy a, a good lifestyle. But um, it's very sort of early early stages of you know what will hopefully be a, a great career on paper. There's a bit of money, but nothing kind of liquid. <laughs> and, what, and what about any any other uh, business or investments that, um, that that you may may have done? Well, I think through Prime Time we're so, uh, we're kind of uh, vertically integrating, so we're trying to get into the hospitality space. Um, we're actually opening a restaurant which we have an interest in. Oh, you're um, about that. So is, is that a bar and a restaurant, or is it two separate things? It's a restaurant on the top floor and kind of a speakeasy, sort of 1920s prohibition styled cocktail bar uh, on the in the basement floor. And yeah, just just in Chelsea, and that's kind of with our investors in to prime time so it's kind of this joint project um but we're kind of just it's where our offices are as well so it's which sort of seeing it as building a bit of a prime time hq where we can come and host people and and then we've got a bar down in wandsworth which is a bit more of kind of a fun in the sun cheap and cheerful boozer really uh, how, how did you get your investors for uh, for prime time is that someone you knew anyway or did you have to go out looking for investment there was a connection there kind of through the social scene and my business partner sam used to work with them did a bit of a stint working with them they're in the whiskey trade so they're in the alcohol space um, and then got on very well with the md and the founder and basically pitched them you know put a financial model together uh and they yeah they got on board they loved it you mentioned Bud Light a minute ago, actually, and, um, and I mean, they've obviously had some recent bad press lately with their uh, using transgender mm. influencers to, uh, to 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 p- uh, promote the beer, uh, which has obviously backfired tremendously for them. I mean, did, did you learn anything from that from that experience, or you know, have you got any thoughts on how you pick influencers or how how you actually brand something? Yeah, we're, we're always very conscious of you know of the modern society and, and how kind of quick you can get cancelled. Um, you know, Balenciaga did a similar thing with their campaign. You always think, how did it get signed off? We signed that one off. But yeah, we're very kind of sensitive to that and, and how we do it. And like, it's a fairly, I guess it's a, it's a fairly rigorous market alcohol and that there's so many blocks around sort of marketing and how you can, what you can say and who you can market to. And um, like you can't, you can't use, uh, well, you can't use certain cartoon graphics and bright colors to an extent because it 
it, it targets children. You can't say, you can't promote or be seen to promote anything that would insinuate a state of change or a state of enhancement. Or you can't say so you can't say beer makes you funnier and cooler and sexier or better in bed. Well, it does. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, so you, yeah, you have to be very, very sort of careful with with how you promote and market. Have you found that your your training at PwC and and your uh, your degree in accountancy is is helping you now? Is it, do you, are you working on the accountancy side of things? Do you, do you get deep into the numbers? Um, it definitely helped me in the earlier stages when I built this financial model and I pitched for investment. Um, and yeah, it all came back to me. It was like the matrix. I was like, oh, I didn't think I'd use this again. Uh, but I. Uh, less so now i think from a high level in that i can under i understand you know like i just kind of understand the movements within business and, and what you know where the money's going cash flow is coming later and i don't know, you know just basic things I'm, yeah like uh, receivables and payables and just it's just sort of in my head but i don't sort of now dive into the the nitty-gritty of it that's kind of been outsourced now well, let's have a let's have a change of subject and talk about uh talk about rugby Okay, uh, yeah. I know that that was a that was a an earlier passion for you, wasn't it? I think you played for Gibraltar. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so my mum again, so um, sort of grew up to, there. Were you going to school there? Were you? I went for for a year. Yeah. Um, you can't imagine there's enough kids in Gibraltar to string a rugby team together with. Uh, I know. So it's not saying much about my rugby career. Then. <laughs> um, Nate, do you know what we are? We're a really good outfit for the size for our population size. Um, I think we we're actually ranked 40th in the world oh, really? at one point. Yeah, um, and we punch well above our weight, which is yeah, which is which is quite it's quite impressive given that yeah, there's not there's not a huge um, pool to pick pick from. But um, yeah, how, I, how, I saw, old, how old were you? I played from 18 okay. so as soon as I could. And then I played quite consistently till about 24, 25 until prime time took over my life. And okay. COVID actually, because we're, we're an international outfit, but we're not professional. We sort of pay for play for the love of our country and we get all our expenses paid for, which is great. But um, yeah, it meant through lockdown, we had to stop because we, you know, get professional rights. So sort of had a two year hiatus there. And then, yeah, I've kind of, haven't quite got back to it. I've missed the last few internationals just because of work commitments. And I'm, yeah, there's a few coming up and I'm like, oh, I could dust those boots off. I had uh, James Gaskell on here yesterday, actually. Did he? Yeah. yeah. How was that? Yeah, it was good. Nice yeah. guy. Funny. Yeah. Pl- plenty, plenty to say. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> it's pretty funny. You, you talk about being cancelled and I think, you know, he he, uh, he clearly completely speaks his mind on every question. And he, he, he said a couple of times in the interview that, you know, he's he's always conscious of the fact that he's, you know, one po- one podcast or one comment away from getting cancelled. <laughs> oh, it does feel like these days. You have to be like constantly filtering yourself and you just want to go, ah. <laughs> I mean, I know you're not playing rugby anymore. But how how important or how much is sport in your life now? Yeah, Did massive, you work out massive. Yeah, to um, counter all the heavy beer drinking you're doing. Exactly that, and that's the, the, the sort of premise of prime time is to counter that conflict in our triangle of fitness, beer, and good times. And you know, it's yeah, it's something that's ingrained in my lifestyle. I sort of gym at least six times a week, get out, have a run. I like to play tennis, I like to play golf. Like I'm very active in that way. And then sort of like to be in the pub and have a good few beers on the weekend. And that is quite, well, beer as we know it is quite conflicting to that. It's high in calories, high in carbs. You know, you can have a big boozy weekend and wake up on the Monday being, you know, feeling, looking fluffier. And and that was very counterintuitive to then my week of being at the gym and trying to, you know, work it back. So that's kind of what really stemmed prime time. Um, and the same way my business partner through lockdown did a huge body transformation he was a bit on the larger side of life and through lockdown <laughs> you said you said he was a bit on the larger side of life but your hands did this yeah <laughs> they're not that big <laughs> let's hope he only Just sees a- the audio version of this <laughs> um and he did a full um incredibly impressive uh, body transformation through lockdown and then sort of got himself to the pub um you know as we eased out of lockdown and was like this is annoying like i want a beer that doesn't go and sort of you know ruin all my hard work this week where i can enjoy that beer and not pack on unnecessary calories and carbs and that again was yeah sort of where we went from the caffeine infused lager to low calorie and caffeine infused and low calorie and non-caffeine infused normal lager do you think you do other reality tv or other other i guess uh, you know celebrity avenues or is it really just you know, just being the route to uh, to promote the brand or have you enjoyed it in itself um yeah no i think i would um i'm sort of at that stage now with main chelsea where i guess my profile's at a level where i can sort of do other shows and sort of ha- i've been sort of looking into it a Have bit. you been asked to do anything i've no not 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 yet um i'd like to do sort of the challenge side of 
uh, around the TV shows like SAS Who Dares Wins, sort of anything sort of entrepreneur. Dancing on Ice. Dancing on Ice. Oh, I don't know if I got that in me. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think something, yeah, I'll, I'll probably see me on another show at some point. Celebs go dating. Yeah, I could do that. You you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, your business partner be, being a mentor to you earlier. Uh, I mean, now, now that you're you're a bit more experienced yourself, I mean, have you have you found yourself mentoring mentoring anyone else in you know, whether that's on the show or in other other areas of life? Yeah, I mean, to an extent, I've got some of my mates now who are, who are looking to start businesses, and they they do come to me and go, you know, how, how do I start? Or, you know, where, where do I begin? How do I you know, incorporate a company? Uh, what bank account would you I all this just early basic stuff and then yeah just sort of leaning on me for I guess business acumen which yeah is, is great and I'd, I'd love to take a role there but I, I, I do think I'm quite genius still in my journey to start to be a mentor to somebody but I'd love to sort of get to that position I mean what do you think the single biggest or single best piece of advice you've received is Ooh, I'd, I'd say um Sort of make make decisions quick and learn fast. You know, don't sort of sit idle, and because you're more at risk from sort of not making that decision than you are from making the wrong one and then figuring out and sort of making the next right one. Which you know, it's, it's sort of seems obvious, but when you are starting your own business and you are so sort of personally and emotionally invested, you can sometimes get so blocked by one decision because it can be pivotal to your business, but and then sort of that delay that sort of on startup mentality can actually have more of a detrimental effect and it's sort of just yeah and having fun with it just have fun with it because it is scary and if you look back now to you know to when you're you know 10 12 14 years growing up do you think your definition of success has changed no i think my definition of success i think has always been to just be above the norm and just be kind of always pushing sort of above boundaries that you know and i think that like is, is still the same way i think now well look it's been a pleasure having you i know you're busy you've got to go and get to open, opening the bar opening the restaurant selling some beer so thanks for taking the time out and coming I and mean, obviously we've, we've we've spoken about prime time multiple times but just before you go do you, uh, do you want to give yourself a, a final shout out of where uh, of where people can find you where they can buy it and how they can follow you on social Absolutely. Yeah. So we are all around London. Um, if you go onto our website at www.primetimelager.com, uh, you can buy us both online there and see our footprint around London and the UK. Um, so come find us at a pub. I do recommend a pint. Can't be a pint. And yes, follow us on uh, socials at Primetime Lager. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Harvey, thanks a lot, buddy. And Thank uh, you. I hope to catch up in the future and uh, hear more about the success. No, no, I hope there's a lot more to share. Thank you. Cool.